Okay, everybody, uh, welcome to the next phase of our recording, and this time it's the consumer law uh, area of the course that we're doing. Now, I just have, if you're looking at me, seeing, looking to the side here, I have my slides here beside me. Um, so, what co what's covered in consumer law? You're, you're doing Sale of Goods Display Services Act, you're looking at the remedies for injured parties under consumer contracts, and we also look at Consumer Protection Act and the National Consumer Agency. Now, in this particular recording, I will only be looking at the Sale of Goods and Supply and Services Act because that's what I did, which is on Tuesday night, and I got down as far as consumer protection, and I, I stopped there. So it'll just be Sale of Goods in this recording, okay? It'll probably be a little bit shorter uh, than your usual uh, Academy lecture because obviously I'll be stopping and pausing and asking questions and things when I have an audience. Here, I'm, lo I'm looking at the four walls here, okay? So no one's, got, no one's likely to ask me a question. Um, but we'll cover the key detail for you, all right? So, if just to cover one other thing there, if you get a question on consumer law, and every year there's usually one question on consumer law on the paper, all right? Because there's a lot of questions in the exam paper, you have to answer nine. So there's plenty of scope for lots of topics. Um, you usually get a sale of goods or the National Consumer Agency, or the Consumer Protection Act. It's rare enough to have two of those in the one question. All right, you might get the Consumer Protection Act and the National Consumer Agency as part B or something like that. But when sale of goods comes up, you're really talking about the implied terms, terms that are implied into a contract for the sale of goods by the Sale of Goods Act. All right? um, we said it before when we were doing contract law that when you're talking about implied terms, they're terms that are actually part of your contract, they're in the contract, they're just not written in there. It's like they're there, as I said before, in invisible ink, okay? The law says they're part of your contract whether you've written them in there or not, okay? So the first thing we look at under the Sale of Goods and Supply of Services Act is what are the key elements in a contract for the sale of goods? So the first element is it must have as its objective the transfer of property in the goods. So, you remember I said the other night, the transfer of property in the goods means transfer of title in the goods. So basically, selling the goods means you're transferring ownership of the goods from the seller to the buyer. So the buyer now takes property in the goods or title to the goods, all right? It must be a contract for sale, so not rent, lease, a higher purchase. Higher purchase eventually becomes a contract for sale when you make your final balloon payment or whatever and, and ownership transfers, okay? And the goods sold must be given a price, okay? They're, they're all the, the key elements that would define a contract for the sale of goods under that legislation, all right? Now, the big question that generally comes up on sale of goods and supply of services is to ask a candidate in the exam to examine, explain, discuss, outline, describe, whichever word you want to use, the, the main implied terms, the main terms that are implied into a contract of for the sale of goods under the Sale of Goods and Supply Services Act. All right. So we're going to start with Section 12, which is uh, title to the goods or title of the goods. All right. So we're basically the provision of Section 12 is to say that a seller of the goods, it's implied by the law that they have the right to sell the goods, okay? So maybe they have ownership or they're a licensed uh, dealer for the particular goods or whatever, okay? Um, there's a case in your book, Roland versus Deval, um, which involved the sale of a car, all right? Um, now, if you're selling a car to somebody, obviously you should have title to the car. You should own the car or have the title to the car so that you are entitled to transfer ownership to somebody else. And what happened in Roland versus Deval, they didn't have the title to the goods. They sold the car to somebody that they didn't own in the first place. All right. So if you don't own a car, you're not entitled to sell it to somebody. If you, if you were, we'd all have great fun. We'd just go out on the street there and find a nice looking car and, and find a passerby and say, here, I'll sell you that for 50 quid. All right. So you can't, you can't sell something uh, without having title in the goods or property in the goods, all right? So that's what happened in Roland de Val. It was a car was sold that didn't, the seller didn't have ownership. Now you might say, where does that happen? Okay, stolen goods is an obvious one. But sometimes it could happen under a higher purchase or a lease agreement where somebody has leased a car or hired a car, higher purchase agreement, okay? So they're driving around the car, they have possession of the car, but they don't have property title to the car. 
So it might look, for all intents and purposes, that they're, they own the car. So it appears that way to a buyer, but it's not actually factually correct, okay? So they're not entitled to sell the car. Um, that was section 12, okay, an implied term regarding title of the goods. Section 13 is an implied term regarding description. So what we're saying here is that where goods are sold by description, the goods must correspond to the description. All right, now there's two good cases, quite interesting cases in the, in the manual. There's Beale versus Taylor, which involved the sale of a, of a car. And we have Varley versus Whip, which involves the sale of a, of a reaping machine, all right? And you'll see on the slides, I have a few photos on the slides to help you remember, okay? But what happened in Beale versus Taylor, they were selling a car that they had described as being a 1961 version of a car, or a 67, I think it was a 61, the case is 67. Um, and it turned out afterwards that the car wasn't actually 1961. There was only half of it was 1961. The car was actually made up of two cars that had been chopped and welded together to make up the full car, all right? So the description was incorrect. Therefore, the buyer has recourse uh, in terms, and we'll talk about the remedies that you can in, in, a, in a few moments, all right? Um, but we all know where, that there are lots of goods are sold by description. Nearly every good is sold by description because you'll have uh, labels on products and descriptions that way. But you may have photographs, um, for example, catalog shopping, Argos, places like that would have a photograph of a product and maybe then a few little uh, words describing the key characteristics of it. But the main thing is that the goods as bought must match the description that was given. All right. In Varley versus Whip, that, that was the, the reaping machine that was advertised as being hardly used, and something like 50 acres or something had been done with it. And when it was purchased and delivered, it turned out that it was a wreck of a machine that obviously had been well used and, and was practically worn out. All right. So again, the description doesn't match the, the goods in that case. So therefore, the, the buyer would have recourse. All right. Uh, the next one then is section 14. And don't, don't worry too much about re trying to remember all the section numbers, okay? Because actually those section numbers will probably come to you nice and handily for sale of goods because it's section 12, 13, 14, 15. You know, it's, it, that's easy enough to remember. But don't get distracted by that. I'll be teaching you uh, little ways to remember these, these things later in the year. So section 14 implies a term regarding the merchantable quality of the product. In other words, if a product is sold uh, during the course of a business or in the course of a business, it must be of merchantable quality. In other words, it must be fit to be sold doesn't necessarily mean that it's free from defects uh, because uh, if I'm selling something in the course of a business and it does have defects, if I bring those defects to the buyer's attention, that's okay. I can still sell them. You would probably would have seen things like uh, sale of, of things like uh, flood damaged products or smoke damaged or whatever. Okay. So long as you bring the defects to their attention, to the, to the attention of the buyer, it's not such a big problem. Okay. But what we mean by merchantable quality is the level or the standard of the product that a reasonable person would expect, okay, uh, or would regard as being fit to sell, all right? And um, there's a case in your book, Wilson versus Ricky Cockrell and Co. Uh, that's the coal, the coal case, as we always call it. Um, so Wilson bought some coal, and when he used the coal, it exploded. So was it fit for, well, I won't say fit for purpose, that's the next little thing going to do. Was it fit to be sold? No, it wasn't. It wouldn't be fit to be sold. If you're selling a bag of coal that's all, that's going to explode when somebody lights it, then that's not fit to be sold. All right? That's quite obvious, I think, for most of us. Okay? So moving along then, um, when we're talking about the, the merchantable quality, when can we rely on this implied term and when can't we rely on this implied term? So the term is there in every contract, whether it's written into it or not, because it's implied. That, you, that the goods sold must be of merchantable quality. However, there are three key points here. The first one, if the seller brought the defect to the buyer's attention before the sale, the contract was completed, then merchantable quality is not relevant, okay? Because the seller has told you, look, there's a defect, do you still want to buy the product? 
The second thing is if the buyer had examined the product and should have noticed the defect before they bought it. Okay, so we all buy products that we examine first, even if it's just squeezing a loaf of bread in the supermarket, that's examining it before you bought it. And the third one is if the buyer examined a sample of the product or sample, you know, it might not be, for example, the full loaf of bread, it might be a square of bread that somebody is asking you to taste or whatever like that, okay? So if, you, if the buyer examines a sample and noticed or should have noticed the defect, then again, the, the seller is okay regarding the merchantable quality term, all right? Uh, the case is kind of, a, uh, well, it's a little bit funny, I suppose. The Grant versus Australian Knitting Mills case is where a gentleman bought some uh, uh, woolen underwear and there were some chemicals in the material still from the production process. Probably should have been cleared out of it, washed out of it or whatever, but hadn't been. So when he wore the item, he developed a skin rash. Okay, now you might say, was the defect brought to his attention? No, it wasn't. Uh, could he have examined the product before he bought it? Yes, but would it have been obvious that there were chemicals still in the, the textile? Maybe not. Okay, so if it wasn't that obvious, he has a case against the seller. All right. Um, moving along, then we have section 14, uh, which is it's kind of related to merchantable quality. But what we're talking about here is fitness for purpose. So not only does a seller have to ensure that a product is fit to be sold, even if it has defects, it's good enough that you could sell it at a discount or whatever. But you must also ensure that where the buyer asks you or, or notifies you uh, about the, what the purpose they, they wish the product to fulfill. So if a buyer asks you for a product to fulfill a particular purpose, you as the seller must ensure that the product you sell them is fit for that purpose. Okay. Um, if the seller, if the buyer does not tell you uh, what they're going to use it for, you may still have a liability if the product is of a type that the purpose is quite obvious. And then we'll show you that in a, in a case now in a second. All right. But the seller can avoid the liability regarding fitness for purpose if they can prove that the buyer had uh, sufficient knowledge that they wouldn't as a buyer have had to rely on the seller's expertise or knowledge okay so for example if you go to into a pharmacy and you ask the pharmacist for something to brush your teeth with um, and they sell you a, a sweeping brush it's quite obvious that's not fit for the purpose you don't need to be a dentist to know that that's not fit for that particular purpose all right uh, so you'll have a case against them in a way, but, well, you would if you were a complete plonker who didn't realize that the sweeping brush was not going to be used uh, or not going to be usable for brushing your teeth, okay? However, if you went into a pharmacy looking for a medicinal product, let's say for a, a cough, a tickly cough, a sore throat, a headache, an eye infection, whatever it is, um, you might not necessarily know what the different medicines would, would be available for or appropriate to so you're relying on their knowledge. So they'll advise you, oh yeah, I think you should buy this particular medicine or whatever. If it turns out later that that medicine was just not ever uh, fit for the particular purpose, um, well then uh, you have a case against that pharmacist for selling you a product that was not fit for the purpose that you indicated, all right? There's, there's a few cases in your book, uh, interesting cases. There's Baldry versus Marshall, uh, was a case for a guy who wanted a car, he requested a car that would be suitable for touring purposes. So he's going to be driving a long distance or whatever. And he was provided with a sports car, which in actual fact was quite uh, probably unsuitable for touring. Uh, sports cars tend to be flash and speedy and all the rest of it, but they lack it a little bit on the comfort area because they tend to be sitting lower on the road so you feel every little bump on the road and that kind of stuff, all right? So having indicated what he wanted the car for, to not, for the, the seller not to fulfill that, then that's a breach of the fitness for purpose implied term. In the case of Priest versus Last, you had an individual who purchased a hot water bottle. Uh, so what's interesting about this case is they didn't indicate to the seller what they wanted to use the hot water bottle for. 
So they purchased the hot water bottle. It later turned out that when it was full of, of uh, hot water, it burst and scalded the person or whatever, okay? So they sued for breach of the, the implied term under section 14 that the product be fit for its purpose. Now the defense claimed in that case was that the buyer did not indicate to the seller the purpose for which they wanted the product. However, in that particular case, the court was happy to say, it's obvious if you're buying a hot water bottle, it's obvious what the purpose is gonna be for that. You're not gonna use it to, I don't know, to grow vegetables or something, you're, you know. <laughs> um, it's quite obvious what a hot water bottle, it has really only one major function and that's it, okay? So the, the, the buyer was successful in that case, even though they had not indicated to the seller of what the purpose was, okay, that they wanted the product. Another case there is Griffiths versus Peter Conway, and that's again a tweed product that caused a rash. So like the previous case there uh, of, the, of Grant versus the Australian uh, knitting mill, in this case, it's the same type of thing, a product, there's something with the product that has caused a rash. Um, in, that, in, in the Grant case, the guy uh, won his case by showing that the product was not of merchantable quality, it wasn't fit for its purpose because it had chemicals, etc. in it that should have been cleaned out of it. In the Griffiths case, the buyer failed to win the case because she hadn't indicated to the seller that she had a, particularly, uh, a particular skin condition that meant she had particularly sensitive skin. Right, so the product, generally speaking, would have been suitable for the general population, but just be, in her situation, because she had a particular uh, skin condition, it it caused her to have a rash. Okay, so the buyer couldn't, or the, yeah, the seller couldn't possibly have been aware of that unless uh, notified by the buyer. Okay, uh, so the buyer didn't win that case, whereas in the in the Grant case, the buyer did win that one. Okay, so that's your fitness for purpose, and. Um, Section 15, the next implied term is regarding sale by sample. All right. Now, from time to time, I suppose nearly everybody has bought a product that was uh, that you bought it based on a sample. All right. So um, it could be curtain fabric. I'm looking around here at the room. It could be carpet. It could be paint. It could be tiles. It could be perfume or whatever. Um, Food, uh, you go to the supermarket, there's usually a fine looking lady all dolled up with her tray of whatever it is, sausages, cheeses, whatever, and you, you try on, you try, or try on, you try, you try the food and see if it's nice, and because you like it, then you go and buy the, the product itself, okay? So there's lots of things we can buy via sampling. Um, even buying a car, if you take it for a test drive, that's almost sampling the product, and therefore you, you may purchase based on that. The key thing regarding the Sale of Goods Display Services Act is that Section 15 states that where goods are sold by sample, the goods bought, so the bulk of the goods that you buy, must correspond with the sample in terms of quality and be free of defects, okay? So if you, let's say you go uh, into a pharmacy or wherever ladies go and get their, their perfumes and you, you try a sample or whatever, you you know, you create another whole the ozone there. Um, you sample the perfume, the bottle that you buy then should actually match what the sample was, okay? Substantially in terms of its quality, uh, etc., free from defects, it should it should be the same. If it's not, you, you'd have a case uh, to go back to the retailer and say, well, look, uh, this is completely different to what the sample was, so I want my money back or whatever, and we'll get to remedies now in a second, okay? The buyer, in, in the case of sampling, you should also be given a reasonable opportunity to compare the bulk with the sample. So if, let's say, for example, you were building a house and, and you're, you wanted to buy floor tiles or something like that, and you've, sat, you've had a look at a few different types of floor tiles, um, you should then get a chance to compare, when you do buy whatever it is, 100 tiles or whatever you want for a particular room, you should have a chance, you should be afforded the opportunity to compare the sample that you had looked at with the bulk of them that you purchased for your product or for your building uh, project, okay? Um, now, there's a case in your book about catapults, okay? Quite interesting, a uh, little shop uh, owner had um, a sales rep come in with catapults. I have a picture of a catapult on the slides so it'll help you remember it. Um, 
the shop owner had a look at a sample catapult and based on the sample one that he looked at he decided to buy a few boxes of these to sell in his little shop turned out that the ones that were supplied were significantly different to the sample one okay so maybe the, the ones that, that he was he bought in boxes weren't as strong or had a defect that they'd snap or whatever it was okay so the shop owner in that case has a case against the seller on under section 15 sale by sample they just need to show that the sample was significantly different to the bulk of the goods that they purchased fair enough okay so that's covering the key implied terms all right so you have to remember it uh, title merchantable quality uh, fitness for purpose description and sample they're the key ones all right in an exam situation if that question comes up not only do you need to remember title description all that kind of stuff you should you should have at least one case memorized that you can use as an example under each of those headings because in your answer it's not enough to just write about fitness for purpose uh, merchant quality description type you need to give an illustrative example to back it up to say this you know i understand the law and this shows that i understand i, I know how it works all right that applies to every question you'll do in your law exam now moving swiftly along then we're on to um supply of services so i would have mentioned to you before the original act was uh, just the sale of goods act all right it was updated in 1980 to become the sale of goods and supply of services act because services had become a, a more uh, common type of business all right so there are a number of terms also implied into a supply of services contract by the legislation all right uh, i use the example of a dentist in the lecture slides just so you can walk through it if you like and go through each particular term and apply it to just one particular service in this case a, a dentist all right so i'll go through them one by one the supplier of the service so it is implied by the law that the supplier of the service must have the necessary skill to provide the service carry out the service so for example if you're a dentist it will be implied that you are qualified academically officially uh, in dentistry okay the next thing is implied that the supplier of the services would supply the service with reasonable care skill and diligence okay now i always go back to my little example of the dentist none of us are well some of us are fond of dentists i don't know not many of us and um, uh, so if a dentist is going to uh, carry out a procedure on you extract a tooth fill a tooth polish a tooth whiten a tooth or whatever they obviously have to follow what will be considered reasonable care uh, diligence proper care yeah so when you go into the dentist you'll see that they always have sterile equipment a very clean environment they have the proper dental equipment so if they're going to drill a hole in your tooth uh, they're going to use a dental drill. They're not going to use a big black and decker drill that you could see out there uh, drilling holes in the road surface or whatever. Okay, and apart from the fact that it's easier for them to do the work by using the proper equipment, it's also legally uh, required that they use the proper equipment, proper skill in using the equipment. All right. So not only do you have to be qualified, but you have to use the proper level of skill and care in doing the work and providing the service okay the next thing that's mentioned so well if we if we run through one of those if you say for example you go to your dentist and they say i have to extract the tooth there will be a common practice for that where they have to um, examine the tooth they might have to x-ray it to see if uh, beneath the gum line they would then anesthetize the gum area they then extract the tooth in a particular manner with particular tools and equipment they don't get a baseball bat and smack you across the face and say there you go your tooth's out okay the next thing that's implied is that where the service provider uses materials in providing the service then those materials should be sound and reasonably fit for that particular purpose so we stick with the example of a dentist if a dentist is going to fill your tooth so they go in you open wide examine and all the rest do all the drilling and say right we're going to fill the tooth they have to fill it with stuff that's uh, material that's reasonably sound and fit for that particular purpose so you're not going to use a bit of polyfiller out of the hardware store you're going to have to use proper dental amalgam 
because that's what's used to fill teeth. Okay, that's another simple enough example. And again, if that came up in exam, you could walk through all of these, use the dentist as your example, and that's fine. Okay, you wouldn't you, you wouldn't even necessarily have to refer to an actual case law in that situation. Um, another thing, implied term for supply of services is that if goods are supplied, so we already said they're supplying a service, they may use materials such as uh, dental fillings, etc. But if goods are supplied by the service provider, those goods must also be of satisfactory quality. All right. So sticking with the example of a dentist, they do provide products as well as the service. So if you get false teeth dentures, they're a physical product that are supplied to you. Sometimes they'll sell you toothpastes and mouthwashes and brushes and various things like that. Maybe uh, retainers and, and that, that kind of stuff. All right. So if they're providing you that with goods like that as part of the service, they must be fit for the purpose. So I gave you the example of somebody who gets dentures. They put in the dentures, on their way home, they get a cup of hot coffee and the dentures dissolve in the hot coffee. And they're left with that of no more teeth could the dentures disappear, right? Now if that happens, they have a case against the dentist for not providing them with goods that were of satisfactory quality. Okay, so even though it's a supply of services, the sale of goods thing comes in there anyway. Okay, and then we have the, the, the final one is that the, it's implied that the service would be provided within a reasonable time and at a reasonable price. If no time or particular time period has been agreed, then the court would imply, I suppose, uh, a reasonable time and a reasonable price under this legislation. Okay. Um, You'll probably find sometimes you might be looking for a mental medical appointment or something like that and you're waiting months and months. You get an appointment and it says you're going to have to, well, you're on a waiting list or whatever. So by taking the place on the waiting list, you're actually agreeing to the fact that this is what the time is going to be and this is what it's going to cost you. So they're not actually, you might think it's not a reasonable wait, but by taking the place on the waiting list or making the appointment, you are accepting it. So therefore, they're not breaking the implied term regarding reasonable time and reasonable price okay so that's your sale of goods and supply of services the key implied terms so what happens if the, the seller or provider of the service breaks those terms so you have remedies first thing is you can repudiate the contract so let's say you're you've gone to an orthodontist you've got braces in it's going to be they're going to be in for three years or whatever various different tightening and changing and all the rest of it until you have your teeth all straight and perfect if you discover after the first week or whatever that they, they have the wrong kind of metal in the brace that's not suitable for orthodontic treatment you can go back to them and say i'm refusing to continue treatment because you have been so incompetent and inept you choose you chose the wrong kind of metal the wrong wire or you could go and claim compensation off them. Or you could claim that they do the thing properly. So if they were refusing to change the wire, you could go to court and make them change it so that they're using proper equipment, proper uh, suitable wire. Or you could just ask for your money back and end story there and then, okay? Of course, you could, you could argue with them or you could do a deal with them and say, listen, I'll continue with you, but you're gonna have to give me a bit of a discount, okay? You could do that, all right? Now, with regard, with regard to sale of goods and supply of services, any attempt to exclude any terms that are implied are prohibited. You can't do that. So if I'm selling goods and I say to you, by the way, I want to exclude terms uh, 12, 13, 14, and 15 from the Act in our contract, that's not allowed. Okay. One thing that is interesting is if you go to the dentist and you're getting a filling done or whatever, obviously they, we've said before they have to take proper uh, due care and all that. Um, that may include not giving you an anesthetic, okay? Because some procedures, even though they would usually involve an anesthetic, some types of fillings you can get that you don't, you don't need an anesthetic, it's so minor, or the tooth is already uh, dead nerve-wise, so you're not going to feel any pain anyway. So... You might yourself choose, you might say to the dentist, listen, don't bother with the anesthetic because it's only a small filling. So what's the dentist going to do then? If they start drilling away at you and, and, and cause you pain, it could be a problem. So if you have said don't bother with a filling or don't bother with an anesthetic for the filling, what they could do is they could say, right, what I'm going to do is explain to you uh, that 
explain to you that the um, sorry something's popped up on screen here in front of me I just want to get rid of it okay so you go to the dentist they're looking at a filling and they're saying it's a small filling and you say well don't bother with the anesthetic so they'd explain to you yes there might be a risk of, of pain here or there might not be a risk as long as it's properly explained and you agree it that's fine okay um, most of us I don't think would agree to have a filling done without an anesthetic but I have heard of people having teeth extracted without an anesthetic um, so that's your sale of goods and supply of services. A number of key terms. What I'd advise you to do in, in studying it is write out on even just one page the key headings, uh, title, description, uh, merchantable quality, fitness for purpose, sale by sample, right? Just the headings. Then a name of a case under each heading and maybe a picture to help you remember the case. And that's the beginnings of what we call a memory map, okay? Uh, because you need good structure on an answer like that to get a good mark okay um, and it's a nice one if it comes up it's a nice one to get a good mark on. all right so we leave it there uh, when I see us on Tuesday in the Academy we're going to start again on the next section of consumer law be the Consumer Protection Act all right so apologies for the, the problem with the microphone on Tuesday night all my fault didn't switch off the, the mute button and um, so see you soon thank you